everyone and welcome to the 17th lecture of remote sensing course and uh, especially we will be focusing on uh, radar remote sensing and more on towards the SAR interferometry or in SOD we call in SAR technique. So far we have been uh, discussing mainly the passive remote sensing uh, technique uh, where or more optical uh, where the illumination source is generally sun. But in uh, radar remote sensing which is active remote sensing the source is will be itself on the uh, sensor or satellite. And uh, as you know that uh, microwave remote sensing uh, it is having 1 centimeter to 1 meter in uh, wavelength and it senses and encompasses both active and passive form of remote sensing. Uh, so, if we divide this microwave remote sensing, microwave remote sensing can also be divided as also earlier mentioned in the beginning of this course as active microwave and passive microwave remote sensing. Even for some time we had uh, on passive microwave uh, uh, sensors on, on pi in passive micro region, but because of very coarse uh, resolution. Uh, those way were never become very popular. However, active microwave is very very popular uh, uh, remote sensing and especially because of SAR interferometry it has become uh, further popular. The main reason is the longer wavelength and uh, that uh, and it allows the uh, of microwave radiation which allows the penetration. So, it can penetrate through cloud cover, it can penetrate haze, dust and uh, except in where uh, rare weather phenomena like heaviest rainfall when we are having. Otherwise because being in a longer wavelength it can penetrate through all these um, meteorological uh, or atmospheric distortions which we consider in other optical uh, remote sensing. And this uh, detection of microwave energy uh, is almost in all weather uh, and uh, day and night uh, kind of technology. Uh, this uh, penetration uh, of uh, microwave remote sensing allowed us in India to discover the old courses of uh, Saraswati river in Rajasthan. Because uh, if uh, you are having dry soil even uh, microwave uh, signals can penetrate uh, up to few meters and if wherever the moisture was found that has been detected. So, old uh, courses of uh, Saraswati river which is still had uh, some water supply through say old channels. And uh, today on the surface though you see just sand or sand dunes, but uh, on the top in the in, in beneath that uh, sand uh, uh, below few meters their old courses were present and those were detected uh, using uh, remote sensing, microwave remote sensing or radar remote sensing. So, this is the advantage of having longer wavelength and penetration capabilities of this one. As a, a we have seen this one earlier also that in active remote sensing uh, in micro like radar remote sensing we uh, instrument sends the pulse uh, like here in an aircraft is shown, but uh, we can assume also in a satellite sends the fault and whatever the back is scattered after uh, interacting with different objects of the surface of the earth are returned and these are recorded and based on this the distance are measured which is a basically a ranging technique. And uh, then we uh, then we uh, ultimately create through a complex numbers we create an image which is we call as radar image. So, likewise uh, with the time we uh, that at the travel time it gives us the distance of different objects. Whereas, in passive microwave the illumination source is generally sun or natural emissions and can uh, give a problem. Uh, here it is shown that uh, if there are clouds then you are having problem in passive microwave, but uh, in a normal uh, remote sensing uh, even. So, now in uh, just slightly about the passive microwave rather than active microwave that passive microwave as I have said the sensor detects the naturally emitted microwave energy related to temperature and moisture properties of the emitting objects or surface within the field of view. Passive microwave sensors are typically radiometer scanners and antenna is used to detect and record microwave energy. But this energy is so small, this energy is so small uh, that a high resolution passive microwave images cannot be generated so easily. And therefore, in order to get sufficient energy which can reach up to the satellite large area was involved. 
and that means compromising on a spatial resolution and that is why I said like SSMI, SSMR and uh, sensors were there on board of different missions uh, which were in the passive microwave region but they had re relatively very poor spatial resolution as I mentioned about 30 kilometer. So, uh, because of the less energy available to the sensor uh, passive microwave never became that popular. So, the energy available is very small as I have already mentioned compared to optical wavelengths like in case of uh, uh, simple passive remote sensing this field of view must be large to detect the enough energy to record as a signal and the most passive microwave sensors are therefore characterized by low spatial resolution and that became a problem with them. The popular one is the active microwave where it provides their own source of microwave radiation to illuminate the target and this source is coming basically from the sensor itself. So, there are two, uh, two types of uh, sensor systems are exist one is imaging another one non imaging. The most common form of imaging active microwave sensor is radar which is what is being used radar is a uh, abbreviation which is stands for radio detection and ranging. So, basically radar remote sensing or microwave remote sensing in short we say is a ranging technique and based on that everything then later on are derived. So, the sensor transmits a microwave signal radio signal towards the target and if it is on the on board of a satellite then towards the earth which is having different objects present and detects the back scattered portion of the signal. And this uh, the this uh, strength of that back scattered signal is made to discriminate between different targets and time delay between transmitted and reflected signals determines the distance or the range to the target. So, the strength the changes in its strength and time it has taken these two uh, uh, parameters will help us uh, to uh, make a make an image through a complex number. So, here this is shown uh, through an aircraft that airborne radar system also exists that a, a pulse is sent towards the earth and then back is scattered which is shown in this view graph as a or in short we say echo also and that is recorded. So, this is transmitted this is back scattered and likewise the your aircraft or satellite keeps forward moving having movement. So, radar is essentially a ranging or distance measuring device it consists fundamentally of a transmitter it has to have its own illumination source a receiver an antenna and an electronic systems to process uh, and record the data. And this uh, transmitter generates successive short bursts uh, or pulses of microwave as soon a at a regular intervals which are focused by antenna and into the beam. And this radar beam illuminates the surface illuminates means uh, uh, the pulse is there and uh, then uh, oblique and this is not nadir beam. So, far the passive uh, remote sensing is always nadir viewing in most of the cases except in generating stereo pairs. But this is uh, a, it is oblique because a, if satellite is moving like forward then it sends a pulse and when the back scattered comes back by that time the satellite is there and to collect that back scattered. Otherwise uh, if it is nadir then it will move off and it will not be able to collect it unless we are having a very huge antenna which is not possible in a space borne platforms. So, the antenna receives a portion of a transmitted energy reflected or back scattered from various objects within the illuminated beam and this then by measuring the time delay between the transmission of the pulse and the reception of back scattered that or also called echo from different targets their distances from the radar and thus their location can be determined. And as sensor platform moves forward recording and processing of back scattered signals built up a two dimensional image of a complex numbers of that part of the area or earth, that part of the earth. As a, there are a different uh, 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 radar frequency bands which are uh, which have been used like L band which is located here then you are having S band then C band and X band. So, C band and X bands have become very popular, but there are different satellites are having different bands which we will see which are still operational. Then you are having KU, KK and 
and W bands are there. The most popular one are the C and X band. So, microwave region of a spectrum is quite large as you can see from 1 centimeter to uh, you know 1 meter and uh, in that way in is quite large to visible and infrared and there are several wavelengths range or bands commonly used in this. And this the, the big basic advantage the major advantage is the penetration. So, penetration is the key factor for selecting the wavelength which band C band or X band depending on our requirements accordingly the sensors are designed. The longer the wavelength if we go in this example right way the smaller the frequency is going to be the stronger the penetration into vegetation and soil especially in dry vegetation. Soil or sand and I gave the example of discovering the lost courses of Saraswati over, over dry sand. If it is having water then dry electric constant are different then energy is absorbed and then detection the penetration does not become possible. So, different satellites like airborne this a, a ASR or a, a this Allos Pulsar which is still operational Allos Pulsar 2 is working it is in L band. So, it is on uh, uh, relatively in a lesser uh, wavelength and uh, then uh, like a C band as I mentioned is very popular and uh, 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 the first radar remote sensing satellite was a radar set then ERS, NV set these were the European satellite uh, which has the ASR sensor then RI set is our own Indian uh, remote sensing satellite uh, radar remote sensing satellite and Sentinel these, these are still working in C band these are still working allos 2 is also working and then X band in the Terra uh, which is also being used and then uh, some uh, some bands are purely reserved for army or military purposes like K, K, U bands and other things. So, mainly L band uh, because of allos pulsar or C band or X bands these are the very common bands of radar remote sensing which are being used here. Now, uh, the, these values are important because when we go for SAR interferometry uh, we, we see that uh, what is the, uh, the, uh, the wavelength of a, in a particular band because this wavelength uh, we divide by 2 in order to uh, measure uh, the deformation which has taken place. So, one has to uh, remember that what uh, wavelength is individual bands are having against a satellite. So, like a sentinel if I am using sentinel data in interferogram if I have to estimate the ground deformation then I will divide this value. Basically, it is not exactly 5 in case of uh, this uh, NV shed or in sentinel it was 5.6 centimeter. So, where it is located that value exact value has to use and then divide it by 2 and count a 1 uh, width of a fringe. So, microwave remote sensing. Uh, in this uh, respective of wavelength radar signals can transmit horizontal or vertical electric field vectors and uh, receives either horizontal or vertical return view. So, there can be different combinations in it there are certain advantages uh, and uh, uh, the basic physical processes responsible for light polarize HH or VV return are quasi specular surface reflection and, and for example like calm water that is without any waves or disturbances will appear black in such, such situations. And uh, we can also as a uh, cross polarize is also possible return is usually but this kind of uh, back scatter is very poor. So, uh, in certain applications one can think in that, uh, but uh, generally cross polarizations are not uh, uh, used. Four combinations one is horizontal HH another one is VV or we can have in combination uh, that uh, we can have HV or VH for vertical that like means when we say HS means uh, the transmission and receiving both are in the same and uh, uh, like in horizontal transmit horizontal receive uh, vertical transmit vertical receive horizontal transmit vertical receive or in reverse is also possible. So, depending on the requirements and the design of sensors these are decided. And once they are uh, decided for a particular sensor, it is fixed throughout the life of that sensor. So, radar is a, a what how that image is created that as I have mentioned that each pixel gives a complex number 
it's not a simple image like we have seen in passive remote sensing that you are having a pixel and uh, it is having a digital number which might be a reflection uh, value or might be emitted value it is not like that here a radar image each pixel is a complex number and which complex that complex number contains two major information one is amplitude another one is phase information and about the microwave field scattered by the uh, scatters like uh, scatterers like rocks vegetation building etc so different objects will scatter differently so being the corresponding resolution cell projected on the ground so this uh, this is very important to note that in normal passive remote sensing the pixel value is indicating just having one value but here is a complex number having amplitude information as well as phase information so different rows of image are associated with different azimuth locations because for every uh, row the azimuth location is changing because satellite is also moving and whereas different columns indicate different slant range location we will see through a diagram and uh, that this is what the slant range is called if a, a flight path is like this this is the slant range a oblique view is there this is the height that is the altitude and this is the range projected on a horizontal plane so this is the bend uh, or the main width or the swath we call so only this much strip of the part of the earth will be covered and uh, there uh, the la the farthest part is called far swath the nearest is called the near range or near swath or in middle swath and uh, then this is the incident angle because it's a complex number so all these things are very very important here now interferometry interferometry uh, requires that the same area should have been looked at least twice maybe from different angle or maybe from the same angle but there might be in between changes on the ground so if this happens then we can measure or estimate the ground deformations which has taken or changes on the ground has taking place within those two dates when the two data sets have been acquired so in this one a, a, that is a synthetic aperture radar the satellite sar can observe the same area from slightly different look angles it is very difficult in a space borne radar remote sensing that you can visit or revisit the same area with same look angle there might be some changes doesn't matter these things can be processed and still uh, deformation estimations or change estimations can be done very accurately so this can either be done simultaneously this is also possible this was done in case of uh, this srtm subtle radar topographic mission instead of revisiting the same site a mast a long pole was uh, put uh, on the on the spacecraft itself and it was taking the it was looking the same area or making a radar image from two different angles and that data was used to create a digital elevation model so that is also possible but uh, that was an uh, mission only it lasted for about 20 days it covered uh, almost entire globe and uh, purpose was solved but uh, having a such a long a uh, mast is not possible all the time on the uh, spacecraft so different time or at different times rather than simultaneously at one time with two different angles or at different times by exploiting repetitive orb orbits of the same that is for the chain detection so interferometry uh, sar or in short as i have mentioned we also is known now as insar allows accurate measurements of radi radiation travel path because of its coherence coherence is very much required for this this kind of chain detection using radar remote sensing especially in sar then measurements of travel path variations as a function of satellite position and time of acquisition allow generation of digital elevation model like in subtle radar topographic mission but otherwise also digital elevation models at very high resolution can also be generated and measurement of a uh, centimetric surface deformations of that this is very very important of a millimeter accuracy uh, deformations of the earth uh, can be measured we will see some examples as well how it is done uh, basically uh, 
uh, suppose there is a orbit one of the, the satellite next time it is orbiting may not be from exactly from same location. In both these uh, overpasses it has covered an area this much area and this is the strip. Now using this data and is the, this is the uh, perpendicular baseline and this is very important if this perpendicular baseline is very less that means the both during the both visits the satellite was almost in the same location then we can uh, achieve better coherence and uh, whatever the deformations which has taken place on the ground may be induced by an earthquake or may be flooding, landslide, subsidence, any other such uh, reasons can be measured or may uh, very accurately. So, this is uh, that is why this perpendicular baseline is very very important and this is how in through two visits of uh, the same satellite uh, can allow us to create interferograms. The distance between two satellites as mentioned here or orbits in the plane perpendicular the orbit is called the interferometric baseline and its projection perpendicular to this is interferometric baseline in black and red one is the perpendicular baseline. Perpendicular baseline becomes very important for any deformation studies and this uh, SR interferograms is generated by cross multiplying pixel by pixel the first SAR image with the complex conjugate of the second and the again here the phase difference because a this complex number or if, be, if I say very in a normal term the a pixel of a radar image that is carrying two values one is amplitude another one is uh, your phase. So, I can I can uh, use either one. So, if I use the phase of uh, image 1 and image 2 then, then the phase difference can give me the deformation information. So, this is how it is achieved. Thus the interferogram amplitude is the amplitude of the first image multiplied by that of the second one. Whereas, its phase the interferometric phase is the phase difference between the images. The example here in which uh, uh, this is NVSAT data and uh, uh, of uh, your uh, uh, C band and uh, the wavelength was 5.6 meter and uh, here uh, uh, sorry 5.6 centimeter and uh, here uh, two images having baseline difference of only 0.6 meter very ideal we are acquired and uh, of 3rd December 2003 and 11th February 2004 and in between an earthquake on 26 December 2003 of magnitude 6.6 .6, which is known as bomb earthquake of Iran occurred. Now using these two uh, uh, SAR images interferograms were generated and all these fringes are telling that how much deformation and where deformation has taken place. Now, these color patterns this, these have to be interpreted, but there are uh, automatic way also. Uh, so, like uh, if I get uh, from if I from the center I have to see the colors if I if I see that uh, cyan magenta and uh, cyan yellow magenta this kind of scheme I found then I say that this is probably uh, the subsidence which has occurred here. So, like in this example if I start from uh, center to away where I am having less concentration of uh, in, in uh, fringes than cyan yellow magenta. So, that means this area must have gone uh, subsided whereas, magenta like uh, if I start here magenta yellow cyan magenta yellow cyan that means this area must have risen and half the wavelength. So, 5.6 centimeter uh, was the wavelength of NVSAT ASR sensor. So, half the wavelength is counted. So, if I count number of these fringes multiply by 2.6 uh, or 2.8 half the wavelength that is 5.6 divided by 2, 2.8 then I get exact deformation and this can also be done using some softwares. So, a deformation maps was also uh, generated in that case. Now, wherever uh, wherever the fringe if no changes has occurred then it will show a no, a no fringes will be observed, but if uh, the ground has got deformations then fringes will have 
a far distances and wherever the more concentration or steep changes has occurred on the ground then we will see very closed fringes like in three examples no changes, no deformation, some deformation and a very sharp deformation and uh, they are also demonstrated through these models. So, this uh, this interferogram was later as I mentioned was converted through the uh, in, uh, you know computer based interpretation in a form of deformation map and as you can see that uh, this area subsided by 20 centimeter and this area got uplifted because of that earthquake by 30 centimeter. So, this is these are the plus values in terms of uh, before earthquake and after earthquake. So, after earthquake this area got uplifted by 30 centimeter and this green area got subsided by 20 centimeter. So, this is a very unique very powerful technique that is the INSAR technique to uh, exploit or to measure uh, such deformations which otherwise are impossible to measure. And as you know I have been saying in this course of remote sensing that remote sensing not only provides the synoptic view, not only provides the digital data, but is a completely unbiased recordings. And these satellites are orbiting continuously acquiring the data if an such event occurs I get just uh, we have to get the pre earthquake data as close as possible and post earthquake data. And uh, once these data is there coherence is available then things can be. Why uh, the less coherence was available in these wide patches because, because of the, the these areas have the buildings or built up areas and that got completely. Uh, wiped out because of that earthquake. So, that is why there were less coherence otherwise no problem the still this can be measured and all of a sudden these fringes stopped here all of a sudden these fringes because there is the fault line was going some like this only roughly north south in this case and the epicenter was on the other side. So, the major deformations have taken place like this some area has got subsided and uh, some area has got uh, uplifted and this is remember this is in against that uh, range or slant range. So, that means what we are what we can conclude here that this area the distance because after all radar remote sensing is a ranging. So, th from the uh, between these two scenes and the baseline difference in this particular case was only 0.6 meter. So, that means this, uh, the, this area has gone away the green area has gone away by 20 centimeter from the satellite and this area has come close to 30 centimeter of the satellite. Similarly, people have used uh, these things as our interferometry techniques for land subsidence uh, due to groundwater and this is the example of uh, Kolkata city where in uh, between 92 to 98 in, uh, in uh, say, uh, roughly 6 years times about 5 to or about 6 millimeter uh, per year subsidence have been observed in this part of the country. So, the subsidence or ground deformations might be earthquake, landslide, groundwater, mining all these now is possible to measure. Another very important thing is earlier like uh, NV set data, radar set data, even allows pulsa, these data uh, becomes uh, very, very expensive. But the Sentinel-1 data is free and it is providing interferometric data. RISET though say radar remote sensing, but it does not have the capability of providing interferogram, interferometry data for interferograms. But uh, the Sentinel data is free provides the data one can wherever one find problem related with ground deformation induced by some uh, factor then one can employ and estimate this thing. And the last one here is example of uh, recently occurred a uh, major earthquake in uh, Nepal. There were two successive earthquakes and uh, using Allos Pulsar data uh, this, this is how the fringes uh, were generated and uh, the subsidence the upliftment of about 1 meter in Kathmandu valley uh, was induced by that, uh, that particular earthquake of uh, um, um, 25th um, April 2015 of magnitude 7.8. So, this has become very very popular technique of remote sensing where very accurately and deformations can be measured. So, this brings to the end of uh, this presentation. Thank you very much.